Hey everyone, welcome back. Laszlo Montgomery here with China History Podcast, episode 211. Part 4 this time in our overview of the history of the Jewish refugees in China. We're still in the lead up to World War II. Let's get back to the story. 1938-1939. European Jews were looking everywhere for escape routes and most places had no vacancy. But Shanghai, starting end of 1937, getting in was like walking across the border into Nogales, Mexico. Nobody was checking. After more chaos than usual descended on Shanghai, starting in August 1937 with the commencement of the Battle of Shanghai. Many government services and authorities sort of went on hiatus. I mean, nobody's at war yet except China and Japan. Hitler hadn't invaded Poland yet. Pearl Harbor was still years away. And even though the Japanese could have wiped out all the foreign powers combined, nobody was firing on anybody as far as the international settlement and French concession went. The Soviets and the Japanese still had their non-aggression pact. So Russian Jews got to piggyback on that little convenience of history for the time being. Everyone wanted to appear neutral. And in fact, often went out of their way to exhibit this neutrality in front of the Japanese. Let's talk a bit about the relationship between the Jews and the Japanese government. In December 1938, the Five Ministers Conference was held in Tokyo. And one of the upshots of that assembly was it was agreed that Japan should avoid actively embracing the Jews or overtly trying to help them, especially those expelled by their allies, i.e. Germans and Austrians. On the other hand, they also agreed that to deny them entry to Japan would be an affront to the nation's long-standing ideal of racial equality. The Japanese could have strictly followed orders from Berlin, but they had their own ideas about the Jews. They didn't share the Nazi hatred of Jews. And strange as it may seem, their interest in the Jews as a race was impacted a good deal by their belief in the Protocols of Zion that first saw the light of day in 1903 and was later debunked as a hoax. I mentioned that in part one, I think. The Russian czar's secret police back at the turn of the century composed this document that, well, basically lays out the case that proves Jews control the world. Media, banks, all wealth in the world, Jews are at the top, pulling all the strings, influencing all global events. Well, that whole notion is sort of the central theme in this Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion. Not a small number of Japanese officials, as I said, you know, they ate this up. And there were those in Japan that gave this serious study. And to prove they weren't wrong, they could point to the Russo-Japanese War in 1904-1905. Not so well known was the fact that Japan did not have the armaments or financial wherewithal to fight Russia. And they were in need of some major financing, and they were having all kinds of trouble funding their military ambitions. But one night, the guy in charge of arranging all this financing, Takahashi Korekio, he found himself at a dinner party, seated next to a man named Jacob H. Schiff. Jacob Schiff was managing director back then of Kuhn Loeb and Company. That name doesn't mean much today, but... Think of them as the Goldman Sachs of their day, a successful and powerful investment banking house. Schiff was Loeb's son-in-law. When Jacob Schiff was in his prime, when this was all happening, dawn of the 20th century, the pogroms, as you recall from part one of the series, were going on all over Russia. And Schiff had gone on record repeatedly expressing outrage at his fellow Jews in the banking business who were so willing to fund the Tsar. He'd tell them, you know, the Tsar is killing our people. Why are you lending them money? So partly, I'm sure, to turn a nice profit and partly to stick it to the Russian Tsar, Jacob Schiff took the lead to get about $410 million in funding for Japan to go fight the Russians. The bonds sold through his firm, Kuhn Loeb, sold like hotcakes. He raised $180 million in the U.S. alone. So Japan got their funding, and the rest is history. From that moment in 1905, when they emerged victorious against the Russian Empire, Japan sort of felt invincible. And for a while, at least, they were. So elements inside the Japanese government never forgot what Jacob Schiff 
did for them. Schiff was a Jew, and this sort of validated their belief in the Protocols of Zion in some ways. But as far as Russia was concerned, they weren't happy at all about what Schiff did, and there was some blowback that affected Russian Jews everywhere. And all those who said, you see, the Jews do control the world, and had a little ammo for future arguments. So it may have been partly for this reason that the Japanese went somewhat easy on the Jews. They worked with white Russians and fascist groups in China to lean on the Jews when they needed to, but the Japanese government and military, they were always trying to hedge their bets with hopes that the perceived economic power and geopolitical influence of the Jews could be exploited to their benefit when needed, including perceived Jewish usefulness as unofficial conduits to the United States. But as far as Japan hating on the Jews, there was too much goodwill there that existed from this past history with Jacob Schiff. So I guess you could say the Jews had to eat the same humble pie as everyone else who suffered under Japan's oppression. But as far as an innate, burning anti-Semitism, where the Japanese were concerned, they didn't share the Germans' passion. But by mid-1939, the number of Jewish refugees showing up on the docks of Shanghai was starting to cause all kinds of concern with the Japanese authorities. It got so bad, they had to make a formal request to their German allies in August 1939. Stop sending those Jews to Shanghai. Even the Japanese had to start thinking about how to handle their own little Jewish problem. And some within the Shanghai Jewish community were thinking, yeah, I know that's our people, but how many more refugees can this place hold? Some thought the whole community might sink under the weight of dealing with this crisis. That's how bad things got. I know in the context of the greater refugee crisis in Shanghai at the time, these numbers were small. But within the Jewish community, it was like a deluge. Earlier, in April 1939, the Japanese government formed a three-man committee made up of representatives from the Army, Navy, and Foreign Ministry. The objective was to come up with a coordinated Japanese policy on how to handle the sudden large influx of Jewish refugees, as well as how to deal with the other Jews already living in China. In 1939, the Japanese were still anxious to win over the Sassoons and their fellow Baghdadi Jewish tycoons along with the political influence they still had at that time. They also wanted to keep close tabs on Shanghai's Jews and keep them tightly under their thumb. So this meeting was supposed to discuss this issue. There was some interesting research carried out about an idea the Japanese came up with that came to be known as the Fugu Plan. One of these things that was never proven. Japanese sushi aficionados know Fugu as the puffer fish, a true delicacy, but if not properly prepared can kill you while you savor it. A metaphor for the Jews in their minds. Whatever the case, the Japanese took the matter of policies towards Jews in Japan and China very seriously. They really discussed it down to the scientific level. When you boiled it down to the marrow, the general theme was Jews could be useful to Japan, but handle with care. The main idea in this so-called Fugu plan involved resettling Jewish refugees in Manchukuo and parts of Hongko, where the Japanese were dominant. That's in uh, Shanghai. There's an argument about whether or not this Fugu plan ever existed, but you get the main idea. I'll have a link to a book on the subject in the show notes. I I don't want to dwell on it uh, too long. But 1939, as far as Jews showing up in Shanghai, this sudden influx of refugees was... Without precedent, it was truly an act of human will to survive that allowed so many families to make it to Shanghai. I mentioned the acts of He Fengshan last episode that provided an avenue of escape. Well, too many have been let in the door and resources were at the breaking point. Three years earlier, in 1936, Sir Victor Sassoon had built the embankment house, still there today, known as the He Bin Da Sha. 360 North Suzhou Road in Shanghai. When the Jewish refugees started arriving in the numbers that they did, this building was their first stop. As soon as the ships docked in Shanghai, trucks would be waiting for them as they disembarked, and the Jews would be herded onto the back of these trucks, you know, like pickup trucks, and they'd all pile on, these families, carrying their 
meager possessions, which by this time wasn't much. And in those open-air trucks, they were brought to Embankment House. The first few floors of this seven-story building were converted into a receiving hall. And there, at Embankment House, they were fed, registered, and given a place to flop until they could be placed in any number of tenements owned by some of these Jewish tycoons. In 1939, Sir Victor Sassoon had also set up the Embankment Fund to provide loans to these newly arrived Jews who were looking to hit the ground running and set up a business or service. And you know who one of those tens of thousands who found refuge in Shanghai during this desperate time? W. Michael Blumenthal. Now, if that name sounds familiar, he was the Secretary of the Treasury under President Carter. And that was his signature on all the U.S. dollar bills from those days in the late 70s. Michael Blumenthal and his family had left the port of Naples in April 1939. Destination, Shanghai. They had fled their hometown, just north of Berlin. And this future Secretary of the U.S. Treasury was 13 years old at the time, so he has a very clear memory of growing up in Shanghai and has been one of the great living witnesses to this period. God bless him, 92 years old, still going strong. Britain threw another log in the fire in May 1939 when they put their foot down regarding the matter of Jewish emigration to Palestine. The majority Arab populace there were fast on their way to becoming the minority. And as I mentioned previously, the Great Revolt had finally led Britain to put some traffic cones in front of the main entrance to Palestine. And 900 Jews trying to find refuge in May 1939 on board the MS St. Louis with a great humanitarian and unsung hero from the history of this time, Gustav Schroeder, captaining the vessel. They sailed from Europe and first tried to find refuge in Havana, Cuba. No luck there. So Captain Schroeder sailed north to roll the dice in the United States and Canada. A few were able to get off, but almost all of them got turned down by the authorities in both countries and had to sail back to Europe. Some were able to get to France, Belgium, the Netherlands, but most of the Jewish passengers of this ill-fated voyage ended up in the concentration camps and most likely perished in the Holocaust. I just saw last month, on November 17th, 2018, Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, 79 years after the fact, made a formal apology for Canada's refusal to allow these Jewish refugees of the MS St. Louis to land there. So, 1939 was a big year, and for the Shanghai Jews, Little Vienna was the center of it all. Located along Choshan Road in the Hongkou District, this was the Jewish version of Chinatown. It wasn't as nice as Vienna, but they sure turned it into something familiar. It was a little piece of home brought to Shanghai, and something else, like Chinatown is to non-Chinese, a destination... A place to go see and experience. Same in Shanghai's Little Vienna. Local Shanghainese would go there to check the place out, stare at all the foreigners hustling there, maybe get a strudel or some schnitzel. You want to go see it for yourself. It's that part of the city right by the Shanghai Jewish Refugees Museum. That was ground zero for everything I'm mentioning today. And to Hong Kong, all these newly arrived Jewish refugees went. The British didn't want any more in the international settlement. The French, same with them. They had enough already inside the French concession. The powers that be at the highest levels of the Shanghai municipal government put their heads together, and in the end, everyone looked at the richest Jews in Shanghai, including, of course, the big three, the Sassoons, Kadoris, and Hardoons. Well, they didn't use these exact words, but they were told, you know, this is more your problem than ours, so, you know, you deal with it. Time flew by as everyone argued the merits of their idea about how to best handle this matter. The primary objective was to stem the flow of Jewish refugees into Shanghai. In the end... The authorities in the Shanghai Municipal Council argued this matter, and it was agreed that henceforth a refugee, in order to get on the other side of the velvet rope, had to show when they landed in Shanghai that they had at least $400 per adult and a certain amount for each child. In other words, if you showed up broke, you'd be denied entry into Shanghai. 
And remember last episode, I mentioned the German authorities said 10 marks was all you could leave with. If departing Jews followed the German regulation, they'd show up in Shanghai with practically nothing. All these restrictions only applied to German and Austrian Jews. Only them in 1939. Just those two groups who had that J stamped on their passport. As of November 29th, 1941, they were all considered stateless. And Jews without the J on their passports, like the Russian Jews and those from other countries, they didn't have it as bad. There were a few extra hoops for German and Austrian Jews to jump through in order to flee to the other side of the world and live in much reduced circumstances. Anyone with a J on their passport needed a permit to book passage. And as I said last episode, you still needed that exit permit. If you couldn't secure one, you had to stay behind. But if you could get that exit permit, you could still get on a vessel to Shanghai. But after Hitler invaded Poland and World War II kicked off, September 1939, no more ships sailing to Shanghai. And that slowed things down profoundly. Most Jews who hadn't made it out by then were running out of options. But there was something else that was very interesting to note from this period. Even most Jews don't know this, but in 1939, Sun Ke, also known as Sun Fa, he tried to champion a plan to take in as many of these Jewish refugees in Europe and place them, along with all the Jewish refugee overflow in Shanghai, to a town along the Yunnan-Burma border. Sun Ke, he's been mentioned in previous episodes, I believe in the Moisha Two Gun Cone series. He was the son of Sun Yat sen and sort of carried his father's mantle after Sun died so inconveniently in 1925. So Sun Ke took the lead in trying to settle these mostly German, Austrian, Jewish refugees flooding into Shanghai. This was a time of great upheaval in China. The nationalist government was moving the capital further upriver to Chongqing from Hankou. The Japanese were bombing like crazy. And into all this chaos in China, you know, came this spike in Jewish refugees arriving in Shanghai. Sun Ke and other supporters of this plan had this line of thinking that, you know, help these Jewish refugees out and reap the PR rewards in the form of soft power and possible support for China from Britain and the U.S. Some thought... There might be something in it for them later on, helping these Jews out who had so much economic clout and expertise and so many necessary industries that China was trying to develop. So in April 1939, the idea to ship all these Jews to the southwest of China along the Yunnan-Burma border was green-lighted and a deal team was put together to come up with a plan. Someone proposed a special kind of passport be issued and distributed throughout Chinese embassies and consulates. In order to apply for this passport, all the Jews had to do was, you know, say, yeah, 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 to a few Kuomintang principles and promise to be law-abiding. And that was it. Those who were looking for an escape route could use these passports to get out of Europe. And they'd be transported by vessels to China via the Suez Canal. A pathway to citizenship was even offered As far as the refugees already in Shanghai, the plan was to resettle them to this place as well. This town along the Yunnan-Burma border was called Tangchong, located just west of Dali in Yunnan province. Well, the reason this got lost in the cracks of history is because it never happened. There were a whole bunch of reasons, but mainly they were critics of the idea who argued the government had better be careful dealing with them Jews. You give them an inch, and the next thing you know, six feet would be gone. And some pointed to Karl Marx and said, eh, wasn't he a Jew? Wrote the Communist Manifesto in Das Kapital. And what was the government supposed to do later on when the Jews in Tung Chung started demanding autonomy? So there was sufficient enough pushback and warnings made about the dangers of giving all these rights to these Jews to kill the plan. And on top of this, early to mid-1939, Chiang Kai-shek wasn't looking to poke his finger in Hitler's eye, who, it was well known, didn't take kindly to anyone helping out the Jews. So in the end, this Jewish enclave in Tung Chong, with a history going back to the Han Dynasty, it never happened. It wasn't meant to be, but imagine the possibilities if it had. <laughs> 
Tangchong, by the way, was the site of the Marguerite Affair of 1875. Augustus Marguerite was a British official murdered in Tangchong. And afterwards, the British used his murder to extract more concessions out of China in the form of the Jerfu Convention, another one of the unequal treaties of the day. Anyway, David Lefman, the inspiration for that two-parter on William Mesny, CHP 177-178. He just wrote a great article about the Marguerite Affair and the Diplomat. I'll have a link to that in the show notes if you want to check that out. Great footnote from history about this almost Jewish shtetl on the border of Myanmar in Yunnan province in China. Up until June 1940, the main avenue of escape from Europe to Shanghai was via Lloyd Tristino Vessels. Lloyd Tristino was a grand old shipping company based in Trieste, Italy. They ran regular and charter services between Italy and Shanghai. Thousands and thousands of Jews made it out of Europe alive on these vessels. During the height of the exodus, they were running shuttles constantly. And this is just a small thing, but to show you the kind of things that the Jews had to put up with due to their rather unique circumstances, All they needed was a one-way ticket out of Europe. But the booking companies would only allow them to purchase round trip. You know, put the squeeze on when the Jewish passengers were most vulnerable. The reputation all over was that eh, all the Jews had money, and if they wanted your help, there was nothing wrong in shaking them down a little. Just one of no doubt many examples of stumbling blocks, scams, and whatnot that European Jews had to put up with in their hour of desperation. So between 1939, 1940, and into 1941, boatload after boatload of Jewish refugees started pouring into the city of Shanghai, arriving on these Lloyd Tristino ocean liners. The city was already stuffed to the gills with Chinese refugees from the countryside and outlying areas and with foreigners from all over the world. Not just Jews were making a beeline for Shanghai. And since December 1937... A samurai sword of Damocles was hanging over the city. In other words, it was already a very tense situation when all these Jewish refugees were showing up in these numbers. So for the rest of 1939, they tried to figure out what to do as more poured through the gates. And like I said, no one was slamming the door shut in Shanghai, but after the invasion of Poland in September, the torrent of Jewish refugees coming to Shanghai slowed down to a trickle. There was just no way out, easy or difficult. Let's put the bookmark in here. My producer is glaring at me through the window, tapping his watch. We'll wind things up here and keep it going with the story next episode. More to it, believe it or not. That's it for part four. I do believe we can finish this series off in part six. Either way, Laszlo Montgomery here, signing off from Los Angeles, California begging you to please not give up the ship just yet. Consider coming back next time, if you please, for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.